founder and chief strategy officer of Planet Labs, now known as Planet. And um, he spent nine years at NASA Ames, which is in Silicon Valley and is kind of a, uh, an incubator for the kind of stuff we're talking about today. So with no further ado, I'll, I think Robbie's ready. Okay, take it away. Hey, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Um, this, is, uh, this is really a, um, a great showing of the maturity of the industry and where things are actually going. I've been coming to IACs for a long time and Space Generation Summits for a long time. And uh, this is, I think, mainstream now. We, we absolutely are anchoring a lot of progress. And uh, we're getting to a point where there are, are new entrants that are coming in. Uh, doing space and aerospace activities in a bit of a different way. So what I wanted to do today is talk about Planet, to introduce Planet to you. Um, and um, and uh, then talk about some of the progress that we've made over the last year and what's coming up over the next six months or so. Since this is IAC, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail around the aerospace activities that we've done namely in satellite research and development, satellite mass manufacturing, automated mission control, um, and then uh, hopefully that will kick us off into a good discussion. All right. So Planet is a mission-driven company, and I think that this is super important because it allows for us to be aligned with the long-term effect of what it is that we are up to, what it is that we're actually doing and building together as a team. And our mission is actually the same mission that we've had from day one in our company. And that's to image the whole world every day and make global change visible, accessible, and actionable. And if you break down this mission statement, uh, you can see the type of company and organization we are. The first half of it, to image the whole world every day, is the aerospace side of our company. And the second half of it, to make global change visible, accessible, and actionable, is the software side. But it's also embedded into that the why, which is why are we doing this? What is the effect that we want to have as a team of people as we bring about this capability to the world? So the world is increasingly dynamic, and uh, we are now beginning to actually understand that uh, we have old mental models for the state of the world. This is an image inside Google Earth of uh, an area in Indonesia, which is perennially covered by clouds. And uh, we don't know exactly when that image was taken, um, and, we, and it is a montage of a variety of different data sources. And digging in a little bit more, we can see this image here, early last year, a digital globe image uh, as part of Google Earth. And you can see that there's a bit of a river there. In an early generation of our telescope uh, last year, we snapped that same region. And you could see that that river is actually logging roads. And then our recent design of our telescope snapped it again a few months ago. And you can see these logging roads are growing. The world is increasingly dynamic, and a lot of things are happening without people necessarily aware of it. And definitely decision makers, people that are making decisions, whether you are a citizen in a nonprofit, or whether you are in a company, or you are a government official, with old mental models with the way that the state of the world is. By imaging everywhere every day, we, we capture serendipitous um, insights. And here, for instance, from last month, we're able to actually capture an image right before a flooding occurred. With that, you could actually understand the, uh, the first responder strategy. You can understand uh, what happens with, re with respect to insurance and other types of activity. By looking everywhere in our company, we're able to see things that other people aren't necessarily looking for. There's a lot of activity that's happening in the South China Sea and reclamation of reefs. We have a news program that we, that we, uh, we have in our company, and um, uh, journalists are able to get access to information to do two things. One is look for news, and two is tell the news. Here you can see um, a journalist was able to actually tell the news of, in fact, oil fires that were lit by ISIS uh, in the New York Times a couple of months ago. Being able to tell the story of dynamic change over time really puts it into context. Here you can see the rapid growth of a refugee camp in Uganda. 
Uh, this was done with a partner with Amnesty International uh, and published uh, just last week ahead of the United Nations General Assembly. We also have a program that we call the Ambassadors Program. It's run by Joe Mascaro uh, here with us today. Uh, and uh, this is giving access to our product and our services to academic and nonprofit organizations for particular research that they're doing. Matt Feiner is one of our ambassadors, and, and he works at a nonprofit that is looking at uh, conservation in the Andes. And he was able to see that there is illegal gold mining occurring in Peru. Uh, the south part of this river is a, a conservation area. And this image taken early this year versus a few months later, you can clearly see that the mining is coming into a protected area. With that, Matt Finer was able to, to uh, alert uh, the local authorities, that front page newspaper, and the government actually responded. So there's more than, than impact related activities that we can do. There's actually a tremendous amount of uh, change on the planet that can be extremely useful for, for commercial sectors, commercial industry. And our fastest growing uh, area for sure is in agriculture. Being able, to see, um, being able to see crops, their productivity, when to water, uh, when to fertilize, and when to cultivate uh, allows for farmers to make better decisions and then also the insurance community to insure them correctly in addition to the finance sector to be able to, uh, to place bets accordingly. One of the areas that I think uh, is most exciting though is, uh, is about what you can do when you have a whole bunch of data. What you can do when you have a whole bunch of data and novel algorithms to do computer vision and machine learning on top of it so that you don't have to look at every single image, but instead you write a script to be able to extract the insight that you see. One of our, uh, one of our customers here is called Orbital Insight. Uh, they are using machine learning techniques in order to identify uh, ships. And you can see that in that image there. There are a bunch of blue, uh, green little dots. And with that, they then send that signal and sell it to their customers, which are uh, commodity traders and, uh, and hedge fund traders inside Wall Street. So this is getting space into, um, into meaningful information and then into the hands of uh, other sectors and other industries. And this is when this could actually grow tremendously. We have another, uh, another partner, another customer called Descartes Labs that is uh, using our imagery to identify different types of crops. Uh, and then based on top of that, to be able to then predict yield, and they can actually beat the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture's crop assessment. So our approach is a little bit different than the traditional commercial remote sensing um, uh, assets that are in space today. Uh, the, the, the remote sensing industry really came out of the, the military and the intelligence sector, wanting to have ex exquisite capability, very, very high resolution imagery that then allows for, uh, allows for intelligence officers in order to understand what's happening. In order to do that, they task a satellite. So they take a picture to one side, missing everything else. Um, there are singles of these things up there, about a half dozen or so by different firms. And uh, it, it relatively is a, a cumbersome process and it's, it's, it's largely classified as well. So it takes a long time in order to get access to it. Our approach is unclassified by nature. We chose a three meter per pixel capability so that it isn't uh, super sensitive from a national security or a personal privacy sta uh, standpoint. And then to come up with a, dis a disaggregated sensor network to do a global monitoring mission. And that allows for us to capture serendipitous information, activate a whole bunch of data to the web, and then allow for us to really see and understand change on the planet. Uh, this is an animation which shows um, uh, a sun synchronous orbit and what our disaggregated sensor network will do together. It effectively creates a line scanner for the planet. But what's interesting about this is that the space segment, each one of the individual satellites, um, they work together in concert. So one can fail and there's redundancy in numbers. Rather than have redundancy in your, in your uh, subsystems, we actually have more than we need in order to allow for ourselves to get to this daily update of the planet. The, 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 the software challenge, the big data challenge of our, of our company is quite large. Uh, and we have developed a, uh, a data processing platform that allows for multiple different sources of imagery to come in to get it all co-aligned and registered and georectified and exposed to an API that then allows for users to get access to it, either via um, our own visualization tools for enterprise customers or for the long tail of, of users to get access to it through third-party applications. So we're really bringing this um, abstracting away 
the specialty knowledge that individuals have to have uh, in remote sensing to then make it available and activated to developers and to analysts. And that will grow the market, grow the number of users who have access to information about the planet by orders of magnitude. So in summary, we do have an end-to-end -end system in our company. Uh, the, the left two sides here is the space component, uh, which is the, the satellites in space collecting this daily update of the planet. Uh, and then all of the ground stations necessary and automated emission control to process all of that data to then ship it over to our, our product engineering team to process all the, the data, activate it to the web, and bring it out. So the left side is the aerospace, and the right side is the software. Uh, today we have uh, two different types of constellations in space. We have the Dove satellites uh, that we've been building in San Francisco, and we also have the RapidEye satellites, which were launched in uh, the late 2000s and uh, has been collecting imagery from the planet for the last seven, eight years. Uh, this came with an acquisition that we made last year. Um, the company RapidEye and Blackbridge, uh, they've, uh, they, they've really added a lot to our team with respect to uh, operationalizing some of the activities in the data processing pipeline and calibration and validation. But more than that, they've been in the market for quite some time and they've created a very, very good indirect sales channel that we're able to modify and allow for ourselves to, to quickly get into the market and sell this. So today as a company, we're 375 people. We have uh, 220 in San Francisco, 120 people in Berlin, about 10 people in Amsterdam, and 20 people in, in Canada. And again, global distribution partner network, uh, selling our, our imagery products and tools into over 100 different countries. So now I want to talk a little bit more about what has made this possible uh, for our company to start about five years ago and to make this progress. Um, and to go into a little bit more detail about the, the aerospace side of things that we're doing. Even though we don't productize that and sell that, it, it's extremely uh, telling and interesting and it's a bit more of a movement of a variety of new companies that are coming online that are part of this, what, what we call a global sensing revolution, right? We see this because we have it in our, our phones and we have it in our connected cars and self-driving cars and our connected homes and with drones, but we really wanted to bring that into space. And if you unpack the technologies that are inside uh, the global sensing revolution, it really is mass producible, high quality, ruggedized, high performing, integrated circuits, components, capabilities, and technologies. And we wanted to take that and adapt it to the space environment. And here you can see our satellite. So it is a 3U form factor. This is Chris Boschhausen. I don't know if he's in the room. He's, uh, he's our co-founder at Planet. Uh, it's a five kilogram satellite. Um, and every single one of them over the years, over the months really, we've iterated it in order to make uh, great progress. So that's the first thing that I want to mention, first of three in space. One is what we call agile aerospace, which is really satellite research and development. So about every three months, we rebuild the spacecraft. We rebuild the spacecraft based on things that we've learned from our suppliers, which ones really perform on time and so forth with the components. Based on what we learned from manufacturing with uh, Chester's group, who also was in the office, Chester Gilmore, um, in order to make sure that we actually get to a deterministic uh, assembly approach, increasing the, the, the quality and the yield of each, each uh, satellite that comes off the production line, uh, changing it to add in more sensors and other capabilities of, of launching and operating these things into space uh, when the spaceship captains uh, actually want to understand more things about the state of the satellite in order to do it. Uh, today, we're on, I believe, our second or third major iteration of Build 13. Uh, it's a quite a capable satellite uh, for a small spacecraft. We're, uh, about a month ago, we, we, um, we uploaded new code to our comm system and doubled our, our downlink capacity, about 120 megabits a second, P with 300 right now. We're imaging about 1.5 million square kilometers a day per one of these spacecraft, and we're constantly updating it on software. Uh, James Mason's group, he leads, or sorry, uh, Chester Gilmore's group, he leads um, the, uh, the satellite manufacturing, as I mentioned before, and he's going through a production run right now, building 140 satellites in seven weeks. So that is 20 spacecraft per week, taking all of the sub-assemblies and the components, putting them together, functionally testing them, environmentally testing them, going through quality assurance, packaging them up, and getting ready to ship out. So this is happening today. Uh, James's group runs, uh, who's also in the audience today, James Mason, he, he runs our missions group. Um, and with this, we have ground stations across seven different countries, 20 active ground stations, large for us, about four and a half to 7.6 meters. Uh, and that allows for us to have uh, uh, very, very frequent contact uh, with our satellites in order to bring down all the data that's necessary. Uh, and with that, he also uh, has mission control. So we've flipped the model here where we have 
dozens of satellites that are controlled by singles of spaceship captains, instead of the other way around, where you have one satellite controlled by dozens of people. This is an automated mission operation capability. Uh, and in fact, what we, what we have had is 100% contact rate for every single satellite that we've launched into space in our company's history. And that's been a lot. And a lot of this has to do also with Mike Safian, who's here, who's our director of, uh, of launch and regulatory activities. We've launched into space over the last three and a half years, 145 satellites successfully. Uh, on 12 different rockets. We go up as secondary payloads. That's part of the reason why we chose a 3U form factor is to, is to get excited for the small launch that's coming, but be pragmatic around how we get access to space today. So we've been doing that with secondary payloads. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to say that within about six months from now, we'll have uh, two more launches in excess of 100 satellites going to a sun synchronous orbit that will take us from about a weekly update to the planet that we have today to a daily update of the planet by the end of Q1 next year. So before I mentioned we have 60 active satellites, but we've launched 145. A lot of that is because we've launched many of them from the International Space Station. This has been invaluable for us to test and iterate our technologies and our operations and capabilities. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is due to NanoRax as, as our partner, but with NASA and with JAXA uh, deploying these through the GEM module. Um, but it launches low, it launches to a 400 kilometer altitude, which means that they last, the ballistic coefficient of the satellite means that it lasts about nine to 12 months. So it's really good for testing and iteration and learning and a stopgap prior to us getting access to a higher sun synchronous orbit. Um, and, uh, and with that, you can actually see the collection of data that has come down. So over the last year, we have a tremendous amount of data. We're collecting about 50 million square kilometers a day. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is due to the, the increase in capability of each one of our satellites, as well as the number of satellites that we're launching in this space. And with that um, high collection capacity, this is a preview of some of the products that we're working on for some of our customers, which we call a time-lapse explorer. So here you could actually not necessarily be a geospatial data expert to see change and understand what it means. Across the bottom, you can see um, using our automated mosaicing engine, taking all the Dove imagery, putting it together into one seamless mosaic, doing it from month to month to month. Uh, then in this case, it's also showing from week to week to week. Uh, with the right type of tools, you can actually uh, compare and contrast one versus the other uh, and share and annotate with, uh, with users within your organization. So this should be coming out over the next um, quarter or so to some of our customers as we're actually building it. But I want to go back before I uh, finish just to the, to the mission. And, uh, I think it's super important to, to really embody a mission in any sort of large, audacious engineering challenge uh, is because there are, um, there are hiccups along the way um, and there are opportunities to turn left and to turn right. And you have to take those in, order, in the art of creation in order to make something grand um, happen. Um, and, but there's something embedded in being able to see global change and make that actionable. And, and ultimately, I think that this is kind of where we are today. This is the story of the decade with respect to Earth observation. We, we have, for a long time, only had select few organizations on the planet that had near real-time understanding of what's happening. Um, and so as a, as, a response, as a reaction to that, we are very reactive as a global community. Forests just got knocked down, right? Um, or some other nefarious activity just occurred, or ecosystems are changing and we weren't aware of it, or a crop had blight and lost their, uh, and a, a farmer had blight and lost their entire crop. But today, with the sensor revolution and daily global update of the planet, uh, we're going to be able to actually have near real time information to make a better decision today. But the thing that I'm most excited about, and this gets at the planetary stewardship element of what George was saying earlier, is that tomorrow, when we have a whole bunch of data, um, and when we activate all of that data to the web, federated across a variety of different data sources, we're, we're going to be able to get really, really good insights into what, what's happening, so much so that we could get to a point where we could have predictive decision-making tools so that we can take into account the externalities of the decision that you're about to make. Um, and so with that, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Robbie. That was fascinating. You're welcome. Let me start by just asking you if I'm, the, the idea that you just mentioned of predictive decision making tools, do you see any actually on the horizon, any examples? In, in short, uh, not yet. Um, but I do think that what, what we need is, um, uh, is more of a better baseline of the planet. 
So uh, as, as I was saying before, the planet is constantly changing, it's dynamic. And so normal is not flat, it's actually a periodic curve. And what changes from year to year, season to season, month to month, week to week, uh, we don't actually know what that new normal is. Uh, but once we, once we do, and once we characterize what that is, we can see the anomalies, we can see the, 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 the things. And those are the signals that really allow for, uh, for people to have a better understanding around what's happening in context around them. In order to get to the predictive nature, we need more data. Um, and uh, we need more data in order to then do stochastic scenarios around what could potentially happen, better models for a very complex ecosystem. Um, but, but ultimately, we, we can actually activate all this historical data, maybe take a look at policies that were put in place and you can see the difference. There's a border, um, I think, that you, can, that you could see from uh, Landsat imagery uh, on Uruguay and Paraguay. Uh, where one policy put in place the National Reserve and the other one did not. And over that, that time, you could actually see how ecosystems shifted and, and, uh, and, and you could see the effect of what a national policy for conservation actually could become. So hopefully more of these stories will become activated as, as people get access to this and come up with great insight that then allow for us to get to a point of uh, having much more awareness of the externalities of decisions that people are making. Thanks. Any, any questions? Yes. Right in the front row. Yeah, hi. I was just it's on. Yeah, it's on. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, as, as we move to the future with the autonomous vehicles and autonomous UASs. And Sorry, the mic's not on. Oh. Is it on now? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, as we move to a future with autonomous vehicles of all types, you know, cars and, and UASs and ships potentially, uh, can you see your system as being something that can be integrated with those applications to provide, particularly in remote areas, real-time updates of a road has been washed out or a tree is down across a, a bridge or something like that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, th that's one of the things that is actually a relatively low-hanging fruit around, um, around some of the analytics is to do uh, road identification, uh, to do building identification to be able to see when roads get washed out or when new roads come in. Uh, and that actually allows for, um, for um, navigation companies, which then support autonomous uh, driving cars, to know to then fly a higher resolution asset. So we can tip them off that something changed and then they can go and check it out. Uh, right now people are, are um, they, they have maps that are super old and they fly their traditional pattern without actually going to the areas that, that have a higher probability of change. Um, but, but this is part of the overall ecosystem of activating more, more data together and having it interoperable together that then allow for safe driving, for instance, yes. In the back there. Hi, uh, I'd like to know if Planet ever wants to image the entire Earth twice a day. That's a good question. Once a day is still very, very hard, and we're working, uh, working really diligently on that. Um, but yeah, you could think about what the extension of this and evolution of this w perhaps could be. And there are roughly uh, three axes that you can go into in Earth observation uh, to, to increase something. So you can either increase your spatial resolution if you want to see things that, uh, that are smaller on the ground or you can increase your, your spectral resolution, so different signatures that you can see beyond visible um, uh, light and into thermal and, and uh, uh, et cetera. And then you can also increase your cadence by adding more sensors into space. Uh, and so for us today, what, what, we are, uh, what we are doing is we think that we did identify a, uh, a really good niche in the market by bringing this time axis to, to the planet, to geospatial data. And, uh, and then we're going to listen to our customers and find out what it is that, uh, that will have the nonlinear benefit to them. Since we do have an end-to-end -end system, we could go ahead and, and build additional spacecraft if, in fact, having, um, having twice a day is something that is, uh, that is desirable by people. And we'll just make that, that choice uh, when we need to. But for now, we're, we're absolutely focused on, on delivering uh, that daily update to the planet. Down, down front here. Gentleman in the white shirt in the second row, third row. Yeah, hello. Andre is my name. I work as a freelancer. Um, my question is, uh, would you provide, you were talking about agriculture, um, that you provide this for agriculture companies. I've been working in Africa for a couple of years, and my question is, are you willing or would you be willing to provide these pictures to any sort of private company, or do you have some sort of uh, due, dil due diligence process for this? 
Uh, that's a good question. So uh, similar to, th this was a similar question that Greg had with respect to um, uh, telco and being able to operate uh, um, in, in different countries. Uh, by our nature, we are a global company. And, um, and so we, we have to operate by all of the, the, the laws and the rules and regulations of the company in, in the countries to which we operate, which I, I named before, there are four of them, right? Canada, United States, Netherlands, and, and Berlin. And we can absolutely sell this globally anywhere. Um, and so that is, uh, now there's something interesting though about a, a global product offering is that you can come up with different price discrimination in order to serve different market needs or use cases. So uh, there can be a, um, a, a discount for different size of, a, of an organization or if you are a nonprofit versus a for-profit company and you have the appropriate license that's associated with that. So uh, we are working actually today with, um, with what, a program that we call Geodata for Development, uh, which is with uh, the World Bank and the Gates Foundation and a variety of other organizations. And there was a panel just before uh, this session uh, around how uh, space applications can help the sustainable development goals. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is actually a really cool thing that's happening in the global community uh, where people are recognizing that, uh, that new and novel information is really going to help the, the development community. It's going to be slow moving and change for that to actually occur. Um, but uh, I, am, uh, I, I do think that there needs to be specialty applications in order to, to make this data even more active for a farmer in field, for instance. So you don't necessarily want the image, you kind of just want a text message, right? And so that's something that then one of our partners or one of our customers can choose to do themselves in order to then get this data into the hands of those who need it the most. Questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, there's a very narrow line between investigating or researching and spying. So for example, here you have the image of a Peruvian gold mine that was illegal. Do you have the, the access or as, as Americans, Canadians or whatever, do you have like the regulations or the appropriate laws to really be watching all the things that we are doing here in Latin America? Or do we have access, for example, for the missiles program in the States or in Korea, in North Korea or, or what kind of laws or aerospace laws or satellite laws are you like investing in because with this kind of programs, well, it's very, it's very easy to point out you know, all the, our mistakes or our illegal things, but uh, come on, we don't have an access, like a free access to your databases. So for example, what is going to, to come afterwards? If you if you're planning to launch 100 satellites, and if you're planning to continue absorbing or spying every little thing around the world, uh, what is going to come after this? Okay, because it's a very narrow line, and I'm really, uh, as a Mexican, and uh, okay, and as a researcher, I'm, I really don't agree with that. Okay, because you are like using some of the things. Uh -huh. like to, oh, okay, to point out something that perhaps in your point of view is wrong. But for example, when they come, or when, when a lot of people come to our countries and get the natural resources, then they say, it's correct. Okay, so for me, it's not um, like just um, thinking of it uh, well, I don't buy it, okay? I don't buy that this is only for research. And sometimes when you have this, uh, how come do you have the power to say, okay, okay, Peru, stop that. So I don't, I don't buy that, Probably. sorry. Yeah, that's a very, very deep uh, question and, and something that, um, that, that we've thought and continue to think deeply about because it is a, it's a continuous posture as this data comes online, as our product actually becomes available to people. Um, I want to mention one thing, though, and that's about transparency. And, uh, and this does have a, a, a bit of a lesson for the aerospace industry as well, right? Uh, the, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 um, essentially allowed for the, at, at the time during the Cold War, the Americans and the Russians to look at each other. Um, and that allowed for, for both sides to understand um, really their capability, mainly around stockpiling ICBMs, right? And with that, that fact, with that data, 
it allowed for people to then make better decisions and not assume the worst. And more than that, since that actually occurred and, and uh, countries launched their, their spy satellites, we ended up getting the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, right? Which then, because they're allowed for there to be a monitoring, reporting, and verification system that in fact countries are abiding by this capability. So with greater transparency, we as a global community and, and, the, and, and for instance, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty is something that, uh, that the global community was able to then watch to then make sure that there weren't necessarily nefarious act, uh, activities that were happening in one particular uh, conflict that then had a massive amount of repercussions to, to the entire planet. So that's just one small example around transparency. So now where are we today? Countries have these satellites today. Uh, countries are looking at this today. And it is not available to, uh, to nonprofit organizations, for businesses, or for other people in order to make better decisions. Uh, we have to be extremely um, um, cognizant about the market entry strategy to enable a transparent planet in the most responsible manner. What we want to do is to not say, you're doing something bad and you're doing something good. Uh, what we do instead is we are the impartial, factual information feed of the planet and we activate that to the web to allow for users to get access to it so then they can then go ahead and make those decisions that they need. They may, they may be able to use our data in the court of law if they're going to take someone to the international criminal court, for instance, for war crimes. Uh, that may or may not use some of the data that is actually activated and collected by, uh, by systems such as Planet. Uh, but that, that's, that, that's a super important fine line because who are we to say what's good and what's bad, right? Um, but, uh, and just like any sort of new tool or new capability, like getting access to the internet and information, it could be used nefariously and it can also be used for very good. Uh, we believe that, and what we've seen thus far, and a lot of these examples that, that we've shown, um, are examples done by our users, not done by us. And these are examples that actually lead to a better behavior. We don't want people globally to be chopping down the world's forest without anyone knowing it, for instance, or illegal fishing or other types of activities. But with transparency, we have to be really, really careful around making that um, an adopted activity. And so that's why we're doing it with a lot of partners in place. So I, I think about this all the time. I think about this every day. There, I don't believe that there's a right answer. There's more of a posture that's associated with it. Um, and one of the things that we aspire to do is to have something that we call general availability. And this is when our data is available to the web for anybody. They can get an account. They get access to it. Uh, then they can download a certain amount of it, just like a freemium business model. Um, and then as they consume more, then they have to pay some more because this actually costs a lot of money for us in order to do this. And we think the most valuable thing for, for our planet is to be around in 20, 30 years from now where we have that longitudinal data uh, that then allow for us to really understand change in history on our planet. Thanks, Robbie. Okay, Let's take one you. more quick question right on the front. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Ravi. Thank you for insightful presentation. Two questions. One is, how many of your 100 plus satellites that are currently in orbit are actually alive? And second, could you share how much you paid for RapidEye? Uh, the, the first question is 60. Uh, the second question is no. I figured. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Ravi for a fascinating presentation. Thank you.